Hello, um, I would like to welcome you to the first of three spring 2023 presentations of the Medical History Interest Group. All three of our presentations this semester are focusing uh, part of a theme surrounding our university's Country Doctor Museum that is located in Bailey, North Carolina. I'm Marlena Rose. I'm the Assistant Director of Collections and Historical Services at the Lopez Health Sciences Library at East Carolina University in Greenville, North Carolina. The Medical History Interest Group presentations are sponsored by Ruth and John Moskop History of Medicine Lecture Series and the Lopez Library Health History Collections. Today's presentation is If the Sterilizer Could Talk, Public Health, Milk, and Museum Artifacts. Our presenter is Tegan Kehoe, the Exhibit and Education Specialist at the Paul S. Russell, MD, Museum of Medical History and Innovation at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. Kehoe is a public historian who specializes in healthcare and science. Her exhibits at the museum have ranged from a temporary exhibit for an innovation festival that used xylophones to explain how anesthesia affects the brain, to a display of the personal items belonging to a World War I nurse. Kehoe writes about scientific and social history and topics related to museums and archives. She edited a newsletter column on medical museums for three years. Her research interests include material culture in the history of medicine, interpretation strategies for history of medicine in the body, and the history of scientific study mythologies from the perspectives of shifting power structures and of changes in the epistemology of science. She received her Master of Arts in History and Museum Studies from Tufts University. The steam sterilizer that's the focus of today's talk is currently on display at the second floor of ECU's Family Medicine Building. This artifact is part of an exhibit that is curated by the Country Doctor Museum. The exhibit is titled The Rest Cure, Victorian Women's Health. Please feel free to enter your questions in the chat during the presentation. We will monitor the chat and, we'll and ask your questions at the end. Now I will turn it over to Tegan Keo. Hi, sorry about that. Uh, thank you so much, Marlena, and thank you to the Lapis Health Sciences Library and the Medical History Interest Group for having me, um, and all of you for having uh, for being here this afternoon. Um, my book, Exploring American Healthcare Through 50 Historic Treasures, is in many ways a sampler of healthcare history, as well as a sampler of artifacts at museums and historic sites around the country. Um, so today I'll be sharing a small piece of the stories from my book um, with an emphasis on one of the artifacts featured in the book, which is that um, sterilizer that was mentioned in the Lapis Library's uh, history collections uh, that's part of the Country Doctor Museum. Um, the book is arranged chronologically and the milk sterilizer really comes in the densest part of the timeline. The sterilizer was developed in the 1880s, which was a time of a lot of innovation. I think this era might be slightly overrepresented in my book because I do really enjoy it, but there was also just a lot happening in the late 19th and early 20th centuries in terms of the scientific side of medical advancement, in terms of how care was organized and delivered, and in terms of public health. While public health makes up a large part of what today's talk will focus on, um, as you'll see, putting this milk sterilizer in its historical context actually involves a pretty wide ranging discussion. So milk using pasteurized using steam sterilizers was one of the first ways that the germ theory revolution reached average Americans' homes. Sterilizing milk also generated a public health controversy. At what point in the process from cow to glass should milk be made safe to drink? 
Um, but first, I'd like to back up a little bit and give context for public health as a field. By the early 19th century, many Americans uh, cities passed. Oh, pardon me, just had a quick tech issue. Many American cities passed quarantine laws during epidemics and took part in vaccine distribution. As the Industrial Revolution progressed, the need for public health measures became more and more apparent. More people lived in cities and it was becoming easier to move from place to place, which created conditions that uh, were ripe for epidemics. Starting in the 1830s, both physicians and lay people interested in public health started collecting and analyzing health statistics as a public health tool. For example, tracking disease incidents was used to track infectious disease outbreaks. During epidemics, many cities and states passed laws requiring medical providers to report the number of cases of a given disease. And in this way, the rise of public health also meant a rise in tracking people's experiences. You can't create disease surveillance without at least a little bit of population or people surveillance, um, a fact that makes some people uncomfortable and others consider a worthwhile trade. However, this is just a part of the picture. Whenever cities make decisions about their water or their sewer systems, those are public health deci decisions. The quote unquote sanitary movement that began in the 19th century embraced the idea that clean conditions could reduce the rates of disease. But an important thing to remember when looking at early public health is that people had an idea that some diseases are contagious well before anyone understood what makes them contagious or how disease transmission works. A popular theory was that miasma or bad air emanated from swamps, garbage pits, and rooms with sick people in them, which is why they believed that spending time around these places could make you sick. I work at the museum at Mass General Hospital in Boston, and in this past year, we mounted an exhibit that included documents from an outbreak of erysipelas in uh, 1827. And now I'm going to share my screen briefly. Um, and you'll see why in a moment. Slideshow mode. Here we are. Um, erysipelas is a dangerous skin infection um, that had no good treatment before antibiotics. Several doctors created a plan to lower the risk of future outbreaks, and that's excerpted here. It included adding fireplaces as a source of ventilation. And the excerpt on the screen reads, the middle wards where fireplaces cannot be made shall be kept as free from patients during the winter as practicable, and especially from those patients who have wounds, sores, or other diseases which generate a morbid atmosphere about them. Um, and I like that generate a morbid atmosphere. That's kind of their idea of contagion at the time. This is the 1820s. During the American Civil War, a number of hospitals were built on new plans that specifically designed, uh, they were specifically designed to maximize ventilation um, because they understood that that had something to do with slowing the spread of a disease. Um, and this, uh, these new hospitals were particularly in the North because they were better funded and thus more able to innovate. Um, ventilation really did help but it couldn't prevent many diseases from being passed around, either person to person, object to person, or animal to person. And until the late 19th century, science didn't understand why. Doctors commonly went straight from dissecting cadavers to delivering babies without washing their hands. In the 1840s, a few doctors suggested that doctors were transmitting diseases and causing post-childbirth infections with this practice, but that idea was widely ridiculed. However, in the next couple of decades, a number of scientists began to understand that something microscopic was at play in transmitting diseases. The French chemist Louis Pasteur demonstrated that wine, beer, and milk turned sour because of living, breeding organisms. Um, he showed that those germs were introduced by contamination and didn't arise from nothing, as was one of the leading thoughts at the time about, um, you know, things that people weren't quite calling microorganisms yet, but they were um, starting to understand might be the, the germ of a disease or the seed of a disease. They didn't, they didn't come from nowhere. Through experiments, Pasteur discovered that food safety could be improved by heating food or drink until the disease causing, causing pathogens were dead, a process that we now call pasteurization after him. Pasteur figured out why some foods spoil 
And with that knowledge alone, food safety could have improved notably, but there would still have been a lot left unexplained. In the 1860s, um, so shortly after Pasteur uh, started working on these problems, um, London physician Joseph, Joseph Lister was introduced to Pasteur's work and began to realize that it was the key to a yet unsolved problem in medicine, which was pus in wounds. Um, at the time, most doctors believed that pus was a sign of wound healing, um, but Lister and a few of his contemporaries su suspected that pus was a sign of infection and that it was connected to full body infections and fevers. Um, and both with wounds and um, surgical incisions, um, full body infections after the fact were a major, major risk in the 19th century. Um, a lot of things that are not really a big deal today were often fatal at the time. Um, a broken bone could easily be fatal because of the resulting infection, for example. Um, Lister, who had a background in micro microscopy, examined pus under a microscope and saw bodies that he thought might be a living thing causing the infection, um, just like Pasteur's living things that were causing food spoilage. So Lister tried a number of possible antiseptic solutions to kill microorganisms on wounds, because you can't really pasteurize someone's wound. Um, and so in these experiments, he found carbolic acid, also called phenol, um, that was really quite effective. In 1871, Lister was inspired to try to disinfect the air itself after reading that bacteria had been found in airborne dust. Um, he developed a carbolic acid sprayer, um, an example of which is in the University of California, San Francisco's library's special collections. Um, and that's what's on this slide here. Um, the sprayer actually wasn't very effective, but many of the other disinfecting procedures that Lister developed um, were quite effective. Um, despite a growing interest in germ theory, Lister also had many opponents. Um, some had competing theories about disease, and others felt that Lister's techniques to sterilize operating environments and sterilize wounds distracted doctors from their real work. Several American hospitals actually banned his techniques to create sterile operating rooms um, and to keep healing wounds and surgical incisions clean. There was a growing body of um, evidence for Lister's methods, but the field was slow to change until some of the old guard retired. Within laboratory science, however, these new ideas caught on and the emerging field of bacteriology yielded better and better understanding of the different microorganisms that cause different diseases. Germ theory didn't just change what happened in operating rooms and laboratories. It helped people understand that diseases that previously had seemed to arise from nowhere to come from uh, to come in seasonal waves, but without explanation or to move through communities propelled by unseen forces um, were actually things that we could analyze and understand. It had long been understood that food could spoil and make its eaters sick if you eat rotten food. Um, and that's a large part of the reason that we have the many methods of food preservation that we do, from drying meat to pickling vegetables to turning milk into cheese. But germ theory took this understanding further and enabled people to recognize that disease could be present even in milk that hadn't been spoiled or other foods. Um, it could be transmitting those microorganisms from person to person or animal to person. Um, so milk pasteurized during steam sterilizers Milk pasteurized using steam sterilizers was one of the first ways that the germ theory revolution reached average Americans' homes. While butter, cheese, and cultured milk like buttermilk had been staple foods for years, fresh cow milk actually grew in popularity during the Industrial Revolution. Among other things, it was touted as a healthy alternative to breast milk and a good food for young children. People have always had a need to feed babies when breast milk was unavailable for one reason or another. And starting in the 19th century, some doctors started to suggest that substitutes might actually be better than human milk. Um, as you know, this thinking has kind of been uh, reversed since then, but this was a theory at the time. The historical record has dozens of recipes for baby food, breast milk substitutes, and food given to the sick, which was often kind of the same material as those uh, breast milk substitutes. And many of those recipes date back to medieval Europe. Um, people were typically uh, given something called pap that contained uh, flour or bread crumbs and water or milk, or panada if, uh, that might contain bread and milk or broth 
and other ingredients like eggs or beans, oil or butter. Um, so it was kind of a, a gruel or a glop uh, that people and, and babies were being fed. Um, but pap and panada also were sometimes used interchangeably. These recipes can get a little confusing. Um, doctors writing about midwifery or childhood diseases um, would advise their readers on PAP or Panada preparation, um, and especially on what methods were least likely to cause um, gastrointestinal trouble um, for a baby, for example, as opposed to a sick adult. The first commercially prepared infant formula, um, which was based on cow's milk um, with some additions, uh, debuted in 1867. But infant formulas weren't widespread until the mid 20th century. Instead, for much of the 19th century, fresh cow milk was considered ideal, um, either as a backup to breast milk or for older babies, or depending on which doctor you asked, sometimes as a first choice for infants. However, at the same time that fresh milk products were growing in popularity, clean milk was growing hard to find. As populations shifted from farms to cities, Americans lived farther from the source of their milk than ever before. This meant longer shipping times and a chance for milk to spoil. Um, if you know one thing about milk controversies of the late 19th century, it's probably the fight over so-called swill milk, um, because that one um, is kind of popular among people who are interested in sort of um, curiosities of the past. Um, swill milk was milk that came typically from poorly nourished uh, city cows, and it was filled with additives like flour, molasses, eggs, and even plaster of Paris. So they didn't, these add additives didn't even need to be edit edible. Um, it was really about making low quality milk look like rich, fresh, high quality milk. Um, vitriolic exposés decried this swill milk. It was a, a big deal in the newspapers at the time, and that raised awareness of milk safety more generally. Um, but the fight over microorganisms in milk um, got a little bit less attention, but it was just as important. Pasteur's method of preventing milk from spoiling didn't catch on immediately in the United States. Um, but in 1882, another germ theory trailblazer, German microbiologist Robert Koch, Pr uh, pr proved that humans can be affected with, ba excuse me. <coughs> Sorry about that. I'll back up a moment. Um, in 1882, another germ theory trailblazer, uh, German microbiologist Robert Koch, proved that humans can be infected with fatal bovine tuberculosis through milk. In 1887, the U.S. Public Health Service started testing milk for diseases like scarlet fever, diphtheria, and typhoid, making milk the first laboratory-tested food. The agency started testing all dairy herds for bovine tuberculosis in 1892. As a result of the acceptance of germ theory, by the 1890s, many city public health departments had founded bacteriology laboratories that aided in tracking infectious disease. While the testing en enabled government agencies to limit the risk of people catching diseases from their milk, it also demonstrated just how prevalent these diseases were. Public health officials debated what they called the milk question, require that milk be pasteurized or require that the milk, the cows and the dairy be tested and certified clean and healthy. Um, so this steam sterilizer was one way of ensuring that the milk was safe. Um, and this sterilizer is the one that is in the um, Lapis Library collections and specifically the Country Doctor Museum collections and is part of that, um, that exhibit that was mentioned earlier. Um, I should make a note about terminology. When these concepts were new, sterilizing was often used as a catch-all term for using heat to make milk safe to drink. Today, pasteurizing means mil heating the milk just hot enough to kill certain pathogens. Um, and sterilizing specifically means a process hot enough to kill all microbes. I would guess that especially in home use, this sterilizer was more of a pasteurizer. Um, it holds seven eight ounce bottles of milk and forces steam around them in order to heat them through. The simple setup meant that small batches of milk could be pasteurized affordably at the dairy, by a doctor or a pharmacist, or at home. 
The reason that a doctor or pharmacist might be involved was that pasteurized milk was a common substitute for breast milk if the baby's parents couldn't provide adequate milk. Uh, this uh, particular example in the library's collections belonged to a country doctor in Kinston. By the turn of the 20th century, some cities had philanthropically funded milk depots in which pasteurized milk was distributed free to children, but this was much harder to do in rural areas. Many local governments began requiring that all milk that was being sold be sterilized or pasteurized. But pasteurizing milk had critics. It wasn't the farm fresh milk that were, people were used to, and so they worried that both the taste and the health benefits were diminished. However, certified pure milk wasn't available to the working classes, um, particularly because the testing added to the cost of selling milk. Um, many people in rural areas preferred to get the, their milk the way that they always had, no certification or pasteurization. Um, I'm going to end the screen share for a moment because I have a portion where um, I really don't have slides and then I'll start it back up in a little bit. Both certifi uh, certification of a farm and its cows and pasteurization of the milk were medically sound, but pasteurization rose to prominence as a pu public health measure. The distinction here is not just that medical decisions often focus on the individual, and public health focuses on society. Faced with the decision of whether and how to regulate milk, by the early 20th century, almost all state government health agencies had chosen to require pasteurization because the low cost made it scalable as well as safe. Um, so it's both the fact that it's focusing on society and the fact that it's something that they could do at a societal scale um, that made it useful for a public health measure. The late 19th and early 20th century saw a lot of discussion about how much industry should be regulated um, and what kind of levels of government could appropriately regulate industry, um, both in terms of what was legal, what was um, most appropriate for the businesses, and those questions of scale and feasibility. The many industries involved in food production were at the center of some of the most famous discussions about regulation. Um, because uh, food affects everyone. For example, Upton Sinclair's novel, The Jungle, came out in 1906 and notoriously depicted the unsafe and unsanitary conditions in a meatpacking plant. I want to put that in context a little bit. The Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906, so the same year, is considered the beginning of meaningful consumer protection regulation for food in the United States. It was passed following agitation from both journalists and scientists about the state of food that was being sold. Famously, Dr. Harvey Wiley conducted a series of experiments testing the safety of different food additives on a group of young men test subjects that were dubbed his poison squad. The law also helped create the FDA and required that certain drugs be labeled accurately. It wasn't until the 1938 Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act that federal law required that new drugs be tested and uh, be tested for safety. <coughs> Excuse me. I mentioned that milk was the first laboratory tested food, starting with federal regulations in 1887. Infection control in the form of both testing cows and requiring pasteurization was one of the earliest of the types of food safety regulation that many of us take for granted today. The late 19th and early 20th centuries saw a wave of social reform movements that aimed to protect the most vulnerable, as well as movements that aimed to apply science to daily life. These trends also created a boom of new nonprofits and government agencies devoted to public health and child health, as well as laws on related issues like child labor. Progressive era changes in political culture enabled the creation and funding of these organizations, but also led to new questions on how to spend time and money most effectively to meet the great need. The first public health nurses in the United States were from the nonprofit New York City Mission in 1877. They provided patient care and education based on the English model of district nursing, in which a city was divided into districts and each had a nurse who visited low-income patients at home. Some public health groups focused on health education, while others believed that addressing poverty would do more for health than education ever could. In 
these groups spoke about one another with barbed tongues. Health educators filled important gaps in public understanding as the science of health changed. Germ theory had created solid scientific backing for sanitation campaigns, which encouraged safely disposing of human, animal, and household waste and controlling disease carrying pests. Um, for example, Kansas's Samuel Crumbine, a national leader in public health messaging, warned against the dangers of communal drinking cups, and he led a swat the fly campaign teaching that flies spread disease. He also encouraged brick companies to stamp bricks with the phrase, don't spit on the sidewalk. This was especially important uh, during the era when tuberculosis was pre prevalent in the United States. Um, spitting was even more of a public health risk then than it would be today. In the early 20th century, babies regularly died from diphtheria, poor nutrition, and diarrhea from bad food or milk. Pasteurization couldn't solve the bigger social problems that left these babies vulnerable. Older children were affected as well. The first school nurse in the United States, Lena Rogers in New York City, was hired in 1902 on the recommendation of health inspectors. They had previously sent children home from school with no treatment when they showed symptoms of contagious diseases, but the children's families often didn't have the means to get them care. School nursing and public health nursing helped to fill this gap. And I'm describing a set of social movements, but in the same era, there was a major cultural movement pushing back against these uh, social movements. Englishman Francis Galton coined the term eugenics in 1883, but it was really American medical schools that pro propelled the idea to ubiquity starting in the 1890s. Eugenics combines value judgments with often specious medical judgments. It relies on the idea that some heritable traits are more valuable to society and that people with inferior traits, that's definitely in quotation marks, are less deserving of their rights. The medical judgments involved included the belief that poverty and many of the effects of poverty were heritable traits. Movements that had once advocated to uh, create better conditions to help people out of poverty were weakened by the eugenics movement and altered to accommodate this new quote unquote scientific understanding of why some people thrive and others struggle. Eugenicists argued that giving aid to people in, in impoverished conditions would only harm society by encouraging the poor and other quote unquote inferior people to reproduce and thus in their view, perpetuating the problem. Eugenics inspired profound human rights abuses in medical practice and it tainted research too. Uh, the federally funded Pellagra Commission studied the debilitating condition Pellagra that most often affected the poor. Their 1917 report claimed Pellagra was hereditary, hereditary, despite several years of evidence that it's actually a vitamin B3 deficiency caused by malnutrition. Um, so that's just one small example. Um, zooming out a bit from eugenics, the early 20th century was also when science began to understand both vitamins and vitamin deficiency, and that brings us back to milk. The concept that disease could be caused by a deficiency was initially tricky for science to grasp. Germ theory um, predisposed researchers to look for the presence of a disease-causing substance. Once the idea that an absence of a substance could also cause disease, it opened up a new avenue of investigation. We can produce vitamin D if we get enough sunlight, but in cities during the Industrial Revolution, vitamin D de deficiency was widespread in children who worked in factories dawn to dusk. An extreme vitamin D deficiency causes rickets, a debilitating disease affecting calcium absorption and bone formation. The children had a bow-legged, unsteady, rickety walk. The links between sunlight and vitamin D and the link between vitamin D and the symptoms of its deficiency were discovered in the 1920s. There wasn't a significant health, uh, public health push to address the social causes of vitamin D deficiency, except insofar as the movement against child labor was a public health movement. Ensuring that children got enough vitamins was largely considered a matter for individual families, particularly mothers, although the concept of school lunch also came about in the early 20th century, and nutrition is certainly part of school lunch discussions. In 1924, um, a scientist at the University of Wisconsin 
patented a method to use ultraviolet light on foods. Um, and that actually was able to um, boost the vitamin D content. Um, so this was a method of fortifying. Wisconsin dairies were among the first to buy the rights to fortify their food in this way. Um, and so since the 1930s, most milk sold commercially in the United States has been fortified with vitamin D, um, but it actually isn't required by federal law. Um, the only federal regulations are the um, maximum amount of fortification and the minimum amount that the milk has to be fortified if it's going to be labeled as fortified with vitamin D. Um, now, because the talk is not just about milk, but also about how we can look at history through looking at objects, I wanted to share a little bit about my research process. Um, one of the first things to do when I'm researching a museum artifact is reach out to the museum that holds it. Um, so in this case, I emailed with Annie Anderson of the Country Doctor Museum, um, which is administratively a part of the Lapis Health Sciences Library. And she was able to send me some scans of some primary sources related to the st sterilizer. Um, so I'm going to share my screen again. Um, so here's the sterilizer again. And here is an advertisement um, that uh, Annie was able to send me. And uh, so it says, uh, when a baby's sick, nine times in 10, the trouble is it's food. I'm not sure whether that was a scientifically backed statement or just ad speak. Um, the baby food problem was a serious one before steril sterilization became the vogue. That line is true. Cow's milk prepared with an Arnold steam sterilizer offers the best known substitute for mo mother's milk, it says, and then it goes on. Um, and so here we can see uh, bottles of milk being lowered into this sterilizer. And this one actually is making that distinction between sterilizing and pasteurizing. Um, so, so this is that advertisement. Um, this model of sterilizer was first patented by William Arnold as a home steam cooker for grains and other food. Um, Wilmot Castle and Company in Rochester, New York sold this model both as a milk sterilizer and as a grain cooker um, to different audiences. The milk edition has an inner caddy that fits seven half pint glass bottles, as you can see here. At the bottom of the device is a pan to hold water um, heated on a stove or burner. So the whole device works a little bit like a double boiler. A tube funnels the steam into the main chamber, evenly distributing heat around the bottles. And when the steam con condenses, it's channeled back into the pan. Um, so it's sort of shown on this uh, diagram here as well, although this one is um, showing its use as a, a food steamer rather than a, as a milk pasteurizer. One of the resources that I used to learn about this company was an 1884 book digitized by a university library and available in the database Hottie Trust. The book, Industrial Advance of Rochester, a Historical, Statistical, and Descriptive Review, describes various companies and industries in Rochester, New York, and seems to have been assembled by a chamber of commerce or a similar organization uh, because the entries read like advertisements. Um, this one gave me good information about how the sterilizer worked that I couldn't find elsewhere. Um, and uh, here's that, that diagram again, so you can see the tube where the steam is coming up and then uh, condenses and comes back down. Um, but uh, using documents like this uh, have their limitations. Um, this one had sentences like, in concluding this sketch, we wish to impress upon our readers that notwithstanding its simplicity, the appliance of, is one of the most important nature and that in the interests of good health and economy, it behooves all householders to investigate the truth of the facts that we have spoken of above. So I enjoyed wading through the purple prose to find the technical information, um, but I couldn't really trust the book to be a reliable source of information on how well steam sterilizers worked, um, just kind of the mechanism by which they worked. Um, I also looked for similar devices in other museums and found both a grain cooker and a steam sterilizer made by the same company in the Smithsonian Museum of American History. This, rather than the various advertising materials, was how I learned more about the Wilmot Castle and Company, 
and that they made equipment for laboratories, medical facilities, and home use. I also learned some miscellaneous information that didn't make it into the chapter in my book, um, such as the fact that some models were mostly tin as opposed to this mostly copper model. And that sounds like pure trivia, and uh, for the topic at hand, it sort of is, but sometimes the materials an artifact is made of are significant. Um, for example, my book also includes a toothbrush that belonged to George Washington, and it was made of silver, which unlike other metals, doesn't have a flavor. The once gleaming copper of this specific steam sterilizer now shows the scratches, dings, and fingerprints of regular use. The museum's records told me that it was used by a country doctor, Dr. Paul F. Whitaker, who lived in Kinston, North Carolina, and lived from 1898 to 1977. So he was actually born slightly after this technology was invented, which tells us that it was in use for at least several decades after the germ theory revolution that got people interested in sterilizing their milk. Um, I used historical census data to learn that Kinston had a population of around 10,000 when Whitaker was a young man. So that gives us a little bit of a sense of who his patients were. In my book, I use the steam sterilizer as a focal point to tell the story of the quote unquote milk question. Because the book is a quick introduction to 50 different topics in the history of healthcare, I had to make a lot of tough choices about what to include and keep uh, to keep each chapter brief. Um, in this chapter, I've chose to focus on the public health story of pasteurization and didn't go much into the distinction between pasteurizing cow milk for babies and doing so for adults. Much of what I mentioned earlier about milk for babies either isn't in the book or it's in other chapters. However, my book came out about a year ago before the national infant sh formula shortage. If I were writing it today, I certainly would have focused more on the infant feeding angle because it would be on the reader's minds. Similarly, when I started writing my book, I remarked on how the inherent viscerality of medical history makes it tangible and something we can connect with, even when discussing discoveries from centuries ago. By the time I finished with the book, we were in a pandemic, and I didn't need to worry about whether people could connect with the subject. On the topic of public health policy, we've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly in the past couple of years. In the introduction to my book, I offer some thoughts on framing how to look at stories of healthcare history as a group. It can be easy to look back on treatment decisions and public health decisions that people made in generations past and laugh or shudder at how bad they were as compared with what we now know. In some cases, people's choices were bad because of prejudice, and that shudder is truly appropriate, um, such as when we're discussing um, how eugenics set human rights back as, as well as setting a number of social movements back. Um, but in other cases, we really get more out of historical stories if we recognize that the people involved were using the information they had, medical, but also social and cultural information, to answer difficult questions. These questions included what causes disease or unwellness, and how do we alter or prevent what's going on when our bodies or minds are unwell? Um, but also questions like, who can we trust to make health decisions? And how do we organize care most effectively? When it comes to milk, most but not all people agree that the conclusions public health officials came to in the late 19th century were good ones. Different parts of the world have answered the question of milk safety differently. Um, milk that hasn't been pasteurized or sterilized is called raw milk since it hasn't been heated. I once had a friend from France tell me that she took a tour of a French dairy once and that it was hospital clean, um, which made it safe to use raw milk and cheese in France. Um, I didn't think much of it. And then I remembered that she's an anesthesiologist, so she actually knows what hospital clean really looks like. And just as in the late 19th century, some people today prefer the taste of raw milk or consider it healthier. Um, I live in Massachusetts where it's legal to sell raw milk from a farm if that farm has been certified to meet certain standards. So that's the certification side of the certification versus pasteurization debate. But in Massachusetts, that's only legal when the milk is sold on site at the farm where it's been produced. So it can't be shipped elsewhere if it's raw. Um, 
Um, in North Carolina, it's only legal to sell raw milk intended to give to pets. Um, my impression, having done a couple of web searches just out of curiosity about this law, is that there are some places that um, kind of have a wink and a nudge when they say, oh yes, this is for your pet, um, because they know that there is a market for humans who are interested in buying raw milk. Um, and some people in North Carolina participate in herd shares, where they're part owners of cattle raised on someone else's farm, so they have access to the milk without buying the milk itself. And I'm not explaining this um, in order to encourage people to go and find raw milk in their area, um, but to illustrate that um, the web of different laws surrounding raw milk and the ways that people who want raw milk get access to it are evidence of just how ubiquitous pasteurization has become. That there are all these sort of workarounds for people who, for whatever reason, uh, good or bad, don't want their milk pasteurized. And milk safety regulations aren't the only regulations that are still debated. Outside of the people who su successfully pushed for fewer public health regulations in the forms of masking ordinances and other COVID precautions during an ongoing pandemic, laws about drugs, especially those that can be used recreationally, get argued over and uh, rehashed periodically. Our current food safety system has gaps in it some of which companies deliberately exploit in, other, in order to produce foods more cheaply, and some of which are only incidental, but still occasionally create problems. <coughs> the podcast Maintenance Phase recently did an episode covering some of this system, titled The Daily Harvest Food Poisoning Scandal. Um, if you'd like a short introduction to the current issues um, in kind of the food safety system, uh, the good and the bad. Meanwhile, the field of public health has taken on new identities as both our society and the big medical and safety issues of the day have changed since the time that this sterilizer came out. In the mid 20th century, highway traffic safety became a notable area for public health measures. Additionally, as heart disease, cancer, and other non-infectious diseases overtook contagious illness as leading causes of death, public health initiatives shifted to address healthy lifestyles. An ongoing debate is how much public health authorities should focus on educating people in an attempt to influence their in individual behaviors, and how much they should focus on addressing structural factors that affect health, such as poverty, food deserts, and environmental factors. So different flavors of debates that were happening a century ago as well. As a historian and a museum professional, I obviously believe in learning from the past and in learning from specific artifacts. The types of healthcare that one might think of as lending themselves to museum artifact displays are more concrete than public health. Surgery, for example, has plenty of ex historical examples of tools. But there are a lot of interesting stories one can tell by taking an artifact-based approach to public health. Um, for, this is an example from my book. Um, the child health focus chapter in my book is centered around these cards. Um, they're playing cards from a didactic game that a public health nurse took with her on home visits. This was in the 19-teens. And this little elf creature on the card is Chocho, um, who was the mascot of the Child Health Organization, whose initials were CHO. Um, so it was the organization's name twice, Chocho. Um, and public health is communications as well as science. And I think this is a a fun as well as meaningful example of that. Museums now are capturing the current public health discussions as they happen. While I'm not sure any museum has a bottle of raw milk labeled as being for pets only, I do know that museums have been working diligently to collect artifacts related to coronavirus. American museums began discussing whether to collect items for the present day in the 1970s and 1980s. Some of them decided that the benefits of collecting artifacts before they were lost outweighed waiting for the benefit in, of hindsight in deciding what would be historically significant. A few of the artifacts in my book, such as Narca Narcan nasal spray to rever reverse opioid overdose, were collected soon after they were used. The Museum of Tomorrow will display commercial and homemade masks from the coronavirus pandemic as well as quarantine diaries, banners thanking essential workers, and prototypes of new face shields and ventilators.
I hope that they'll be valuable touch points for later reflection on the many factors that go into today's health discussions, just like the steam sterilizer is a touch point for discussing milk and early public health regulations. Um, and with that, I will wrap up and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you for a fascinating presentation, Ms. Kehoe. Um, we're going to move on to the question and answer period as you suggested, but I just wanted to first share with you guys the book that Tegan has wrote, and I will put in the chat box the link to that. Are we waiting for the questions to come in? Is that what's currently happening? Can you hear me okay? Yes. Oh, hi, I'm Abby Brown. Um, I'll be reading questions as they come in. Um, so our first one comes from Annie. Um, she says, thank you, Tegan. Do you have a favorite artifact in the book? I think my answer to that changes um, nearly every time I'm asked because there are so many different things that I, I love about them. Um, <clears throat> honestly, the, the playing cards that were my last slide um, are one of my favorites. Um, and I talked a bit about vitamin D fortification, but it was a little out of scope to talk about the vitamin D fortification artifact in my book. That's actually a can of beer from the 1930s that was advertised as being fortified with vitamin D. Um, that marketing tack doesn't appear to have been very successful. That beer was only made for a couple of years, um, but that's a, um, I just like that one for the surprise factor because people don't don't expect me to, to say that when I start talking about vitamin D fortification. <laughs> yeah, that's very interesting. I love it. Um, our next question fr comes from um, Hugh. He says, many of these devices were developed during times when lots of unscientific quasi-medical remedies were being sold. Were there many sterilization devices that were poorly designed, unscientific, et cetera? That's a great question. Um, I agree that, uh, especially before a lot of the regulations that were enacted in the 20th century, um, a lot of devices were, were being sold that were quite unscientific and there was very little way to for the consumer to be able to tell the difference um, between something that was, you know, really um, well researched and something that was, you know, what we might consider quack medicine um, or just fraudulent. Um, I don't know. I have not encountered in my research other um, sterilization devices that were sold that were um, kind of quackery or just poor quality. And I have read a fair bit on um, poor quality and just fraudulent medical devices of the 19th century, but I haven't been specifically looking for sterilizers. So it's definitely possible that, um, that they're out there and that I don't know about them. And certainly there were schools of thought that um, were completely unscientific that proposed alternate reasons for why milk might be making people sick. You know, um, theories that didn't believe in germ theory thought that um, the electron waves were wrong and that you needed to apply a device that would fix the electronic reactions in the milk, for example. Um, and so that would be something uh, often schools of thought like that weren't specific to individual things. They wouldn't be talking about milk. They'd say, do this to all your food or do this to everything in your life. Um, 
And so there was definitely that style of um, of fraudulent device and just of devices that weren't as well made. Um, so it, I hope that answers part of your question, even though I don't know the precise answer to um, to what you were curious about. Thank you. And then I actually have a question myself. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a bit on how accessible milk sterilizers were for like the everyday person and if like, like, could you just go down to the market and grab one or is that something that like, how would the average person get one? That's a great question. And that's another thing that didn't come up in my research. Um, and I apologize a little bit of the, uh, the breadth of this particular project meant sacrificing some of the depth. Um, but from what I could tell, it seemed like a lot of the sterilizers were being sold in <clears throat> catalogs that were aimed at the doctors, pharmacists, hospitals, that sort of thing. And so in those cases, it wouldn't be that accessible. Um, and that's why things like those milk depots that I mentioned would come into play, where you wouldn't be buying one for home use, even though they were theoretically available for home use. You would be getting your milk from, you know, a place where it was being centrally pasteurized. That said, as more and more regulations were being put in place saying that milk had to be pasteurized to be sold, um, it didn't matter that you couldn't necessarily go to your, you know, your local grocer and buy a milk sterilizer because it had to be sterilized or pasteurized um, before it, before the milk that you were buying uh, got to that grocer. Does that make sense? Okay. It does. Thank you. Um, we haven't had any more questions come in so far, um, but we might keep the chat open a little bit longer. That way, if anyone's still of thinking of some, um, but I will be back once we have some more. <laughs> Great. Just excuse my cough drop here. While we wait to see if we have more questions, I was going to share with everyone that the recording of today's talk will be made available on our library's website. So I'll get that link to you and put that in uh, the chat box as well. Um, we've just had another question come in from Melissa. She says, mm -hmm. um, do you work did you do any work with any of the trading cards, um, a type of advertising such as those for patent medicine? And then um, she makes the comment that Lapis has some in our collection. Um, a little bit. And yeah, I think trade cards are a really, uh, they can be a fun source of advertising because they were, um, you know, as primary sources, as something to look at um, in history. They were often in color when, you know, things like newspapers were not and, um, there's a lot of really interesting visual culture. Um, you know, advertising is often a very visual medium and there's so much about sort of the messages to unpack what, what health looked like in advertising is often something that you can kind of discern from looking at trade cards. Um, one of my um, favorites, uh, favorite kind of subgenres of trade card, I guess, um, I'm in Massachusetts and the, um, the patent medicine uh, Lydia Pinkham's vegetable remedy was invented not far from me by a woman named Lydia Pinkham. Um, it's actually still sold, although not owned by the same original company. Um, and what I like about it is that it's a unique example in that um, the actual creator who was a woman was being depicted on a lot of the advertising, including those trade cards. And um, patent medicines in particular, um, which by the way, were basically unregulated over-the-counter medicines that many of which were quack remedies themselves. Um, it was pretty common and actually still is for the things that aren't called that today, but might still fit under that category. Um, pretty common to have sort of the founding myth of the medicine. Um, you know, this, this doctor, uh, healed his own flu when he was 12 and then became a great teacher or, you know, that sort of story um, surrounding these medicines. And then the doctor's name, um, whether or not he's a real doctor, um, an image would be on these. And that was an almost exclusively male thing. Um, but Lydia Pinkham was an exception and her actual, she was actually depicted in this advertising. Um, and so that's, I think that's my, my current favorite trade card story. Thank you. And if anyone who's watching is interested, I know that Lapis has 
um, some scanned copies of the Lydia Pinkham's um, patent cards into our digital collections. Um, so that is really easy to search up on our website. Um, so our next comment that just came in, oh, um, Lane just added in our one of the links to one of the patent cards into the chat um, for anyone who would like to see it. Um, but another question just came in or comment, I guess, from Rebecca says, I wonder if home demonstration clubs presented programs to farm wives on the dangers of unpasteurized milk. As a young child, I drank raw milk from one of our cows and do not remember discussions of its possible dangers. Um, but her mother did attend home demonstration club meetings. So uh, don't know if you have any comments about that. <laughs> That's a fabulous question. My guess is that it varied. Um, a lot of home demonstration club type content was intended to be standardized, but really wasn't fully standardized from club to club and from region to region. Um, and for those of you not familiar, a home demonstration club um, kind of falls under the very, very broad umbrella of um, home economics education, but not necessarily like the middle school or high school thing that we might think of, but um, people, typically women train, trained as home economists, um, would do these educational programs um, for people in the communities. Um, and that's, it's one of kind of a variety of, of versions of this. Um, and um, so I don't know whether uh, the dangers of unpasteurized milk were, um, you know, shared a lot in some areas and not at all in others. Um, and, you know, if someone is drinking milk that's actually produced literally on site, like they live on the same piece of land that the cow does, those dangers are significantly diminished. Um, and so it's possible that, uh, you know, that's why it wasn't being brought up was because it wasn't as big a risk. Um, and I will mention that some of those dangers, um, which is one of the reasons for um, kind of ebbs and flows in different people's thinkings about this, um, but it was a much bigger deal before antibiotics. Um, and now that we have, have antibiotics, as long as they're not, you know, um, coming up against multi-resistant strains of diseases, um, some of the things that were very, very concerning in the late 19th century are, are less concerning today. Um, Rebecca says thank you for answering her question and for the excellent program. You're very welcome. Well, thank you all so much for attending. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to stay on if there are more questions. Thank you so much for coming to speak for us today, Tegan. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. I put the recording link in the chat, so thanks everybody. Great, thanks. Have a great afternoon. You as well.